so yeah i um i spent about 15 years on wall street in london and then new york um enjoyed the first 11 years of it it wasn't one of those cliches where you know, i knew i knew from the start i shouldn't be doing it it was a great environment surprisingly nice people surprisingly intellectually stimulating um i stuck around for two years too long uh, in a dead-end job where people were i was a very well paid managing director everything good on paper then it got to the cliche of basically you hit a wall and you don't know where to go um, i got very unwell um mentally and physically us healthcare system had no idea how to treat the spiritual sickness um and i ended up having a spontaneous kundalini-esque awakening on the trading floor in 2017 um which i had absolutely no context for so i became insufferably spiritual for about two months and then descended into a dark night of the soul uh, that lasted about three years uh, in manhattan that was as close to a living hell as i could possibly have comprehended uh, during that time, I decided to go into a full self-sacrifice mode, went to Fordham for social work, um, tried to become a hospice worker, essentially fully rejected finance as totally meaningless, um, and then ended up struggling so much that I became essentially physically and psychologically immobile, got bailed out of the abyss by intravenous ketamine infusions, um, and then got a meaningless job back in finance. Um, but during that time, started writing about uh, the stuff that I cared about, but synthesizing it into a context that finance people could understand. Out of nowhere, a former client contacted me at the start of 2020, and they managed about $12 billion for ultra high net worth individuals. And he said, your stuff is interesting. Come join us and write about whatever you want. Um, so I had total freedom to basically follow my bliss for three years, um, where I started off with like, 80% finance content and 20% what I wanted to write about. And as of the last week, I'm at about 100% what I write about and 0% finance content. And um, I think within that within that context, I had to I had to leave. Um, but my 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 kind of brand has become curiosity. But a big part of that is when you stop being interested in what you're in what you're doing, you have you have to go do something else. You have to respect that that instinct. Um, and so uh, Sunday is my last day at Sapiens. Um, they were phenomenal to me. They gave me a platform to to find my voice. Um, it sounds a bit self-promotional, but on on Thursday, Wednesday, I presented these ideas to uh, the biggest conference on Wall Street um, and just tweeted it in a five minute speech. And it was a, an attempt, uh, Rufus, to to introduce McGilchrist to a uh, to a to a very rationalist audience and. I'm currently racked. I've currently racked up a quarter of a million views on on X this morning, and I'm um, being inundated with uh, notifications that I'm not going to switch off because I'm addicted to dopamine. Um, but what's going to happen next is basically, uh, I presume you guys are familiar with Rebel Wisdom. Just nod if you are. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, I am going to partner with Ali Biner um, uh, to do the next thing. Uh, Rebel Wisdom, I think, changed my life. Like it introduced me to Jordan Peterson before Jordan Peterson went Jordan Peterson, Viveki, McGilchrist. It really took me to a different level of ideas. Um, but like a lot of other people, I think it ended up being quite heavy, heavy on the galaxy brain, heavily masculinized, quite intellectualized, not very embodied, and almost no feminine contribution that wasn't kind of on the very right brain spiritual facilitator. Um, and I think that what's happened over the last couple of years that nothing's moved on, that um, you have these spiritual communities that are full of often very ineffective people that haven't held jobs in Silicon Valley and Wall Street, can't speak their language and are allergic to money for lots of often great and often terrible reasons. And these groups don't talk to each other and they don't scale beyond themselves. So they may be creating lovely little utopias, but they having, they're having no systemic impact at all. Uh, and then you have the equally evil high impact you know kind of like illuminati style groups that have no heart centeredness at all and the two of them are not meeting in the middle and yet i'm finding particularly in the last three months this incredible groundswell of interest amongst what the sense making community would call hyper agents you know the, the, the billionaire to 100 billionaire group who for whatever reason all seem to be waking up uh, and wanting to pivot but there's nowhere for that process uh, to unfold for them. A lot of them are having these blow your socks off psychedelic experiences, 
and then are getting abused by gurus or going back into society and not really changing very much about their behavior at all. Um, so Ali and I are partnering with a, a, a woman by the name of Christina Koppel, who teaches neuroscientists at Imperial, but also has been John Bavakey's patron, uh, or sort of patron facilitator over the years. She's a learning expert. Um, and our intention is to evolve uh, rebel wisdom into something new, uh, which is essentially um, a content and community. I know a lot of communities, but I don't know many communities that have content, and I don't know many content arms that have communities, or at least not nailing both sides. Um, I think that content now has to have three components, which is um, you have a map of the world that's incomplete. You then say what needs to be incorporated into that map, and then you say why that's going to change your behavior in the world. I think 90% of people on Earth can do the diagnosis, and they're very pleased of themselves when they do it. You can read 10,000 words about what's going wrong with the world. Um, diagnosis is easy, but makes you sound clever. Um, I think less than 10% can actually identify the anomalies that need to be incorporated into our broken materialist models. And probably 1% of those people can say, this is how you need to change what you're doing in the world in order to, to actually change anything about what you do. That it, an interesting podcast is no longer a high enough bar, in my opinion. My, my ideal audience is my wife, who doesn't give a shit about any of this. She's hyper successful, incredibly bright, and listens to most of the podcasts that I love and is like, and what's the point? How does this help us raise our kids? You know, like, how is this, how is this going to change anything that we do? And I think that's a really, really high bar, but it's the bar that needs to be met. And I think you need to be getting into these loops where like, okay, here's a practical action I can take, or at least a, a way that my worldview can change. And then it loops back in. And um, I've spent a very long time about why this message hasn't landed uh, with hyper agents, why there's been no impact. Um, you know, people are very happy to put their name on a wing at the Met. People are very happy to give mosquito nets to Africans. People don't seem to be willing to support these kinds of transitional initiatives to the scale that I think they need to be. And part of the reason why I think that is, is because um, the case hasn't been made to their egos as to why they should. And that makes it sound like a bad thing, but I think you need to make, make it seem like a good thing because there should always be something in it for you. Um, and I think what's in it for them is the, a reconnection to purpose. Now, this is the point where you get into using words you can't use with a certain community where you know, our community would say reconnection to the sacred or letting emergence co-create through you, you know, finding your place in the universe, all of this stuff that bounces off that crowd immediately. And so I think that what, what, what we want to do is to get, you know, Christina, a female neuroscientist, talking to my friend Mona, a female neuroscientist. Mona has spent the you know, last four years studying psi phenomena and has incredibly robust, robust research saying that it's statistically proven, something that changed my worldview, right? But I had people constantly DM me on, on Twitter saying, you know, sending me something that's quite woo-woo, being like, I can't share this with my friends and family, uh, but I'm on this, this kind of spiritual journey. And I want to get over that shame taboo by giving people very left hemisphere friendly content whose intent is to undermine failing worldviews without ever using the S word of spirituality, because I think that's kryptonite, you know, the random random capitalizations of words and usage of things. And I think, I think a new language is central to this that brings people along um, and tells them what they're going to get out of it. That in my experience, most people only come to these ideas once their lives have already fallen apart or the approach that they've been using has stopped working. Um, and you know something Ali talks about, which I think it, it seems intuitively correct, is that a two-person podcast with two people talking to each other, you kind of feel like you're jumping into the middle of the conversation, right? Like Rufus and Lauren may already know all the, the Vivekiisms and Schmachtenbergerisms, and they can have this conversation that's completely impenetrable for normal people. And so I think what content needs to be now is heavily synthesized, fifteen minutes with high high-ish production values that you know, maybe can be done by AI now that puts 1500 pages of McGilchrist into something that people can actually understand. It took me three months 
to put 10 years of work on curiosity and the Gilchrist and Viveki into a 20 minute presentation. And then the bastards at Sone DM'd me a couple of weeks ago and said, can you put it into five minutes? And obviously my brain started dribbling out of my ears, but that content just went viral today. So it's like, I think there's proof of concept here that this, 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 what we're all involved in needs to compress and it needs to pitch and it needs to start reaching highly effective people because 26 people, I think 24 of which are men, control half of the wealth on earth. So that's sort of my manifesto. I'm happy to take questions or push back or comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tom, and, and very, very succinct as well. Um, and welcome, Matthew and Simon. Um, we might take a moment. Yeah, we might take a moment. Thank you, Ola. You've already put your hand up to let people just kind of digest and then ask questions. Um, Ola, do you want to you want to go away and sh fire away with your question? Sure. Um, so my question for you, Tom, is: What do you think are uh, the should be like in the content? Because it's like if you go smart. Dana Schmottenberger way, like there is uh, so many contents that way. If you go um, John Bevecki way, there are like a lot of contents that way as well. And so um, having concise um, content should have like specific thing that will speak, specific contents that will speak to specific people. And so my question for you is, what do you think should be included in the content um, that, yeah, should be concise and, and pushed out to high impact people. Kind of want to know what you guys think. Like this is something that's emergent for us. Um, as I think about our content, I think that I was in the I was in the green room for um, this conference, surrounded by really like famous hedge fund and VC types, and there was this palpable nervousness in the room when a couple of the AI guys got up to speak. Um, they're all big investors in AI, but I think a lot of people genuinely feel they're going to be made obsolete. So I think that's a very powerful one. You know, nothing, nothing gets people focused on the world like the idea that they're going to get left behind. Um, and so I think people are very focused on what makes them human um, in a way that was kind of fluffy and philosophical up until six months ago, when now it's like, shit, am I going to have a job? How am I going to put this in my LinkedIn job description? Is my fund going to get disrupted? What am I going to actually do with my time? And I have weird answers to that question um, because most of what I think is weird um, and I'm happy to address that. I think another, if I could do anything, which is what I tried to do with this presentation this week, I would make people take the idea of attractors more seriously. Um, Rebel Wisdom ended with a five part series of Daniel Schmachtenberger talking about the third attractor. And as far as I can tell, he didn't say what the third attractor was, um, which I think is an issue, right? That, the intellect explodes at exactly the point where you suggest there's something superior to the intellect. I've probably had this conversation 300 times over the last two years. The moment you suggest there's an intelligent benign force in the universe directing your attention, most people immediately switch off or actually get angry with you. Um, so finding ways to finding ways to incept people with the idea that they can surrender to a force that creates through them without using any of those words is is the content that I'm most focused on because I think that can have the most leverage. To, to explain precisely why, um, below the hyperagent level, there's a lot of people with sort of two to $5 million of net worth that I was in a room with in on trading floors that reached my age, sort of mid forties, and um, got stuck uh, by you know, not irresponsible earning habits. Like a lot of people just assume that they box themselves into a corner, but just the pressures of life in the tri-state area. And they're told, as I was many, many times, that they cannot reinvent themselves because their salary expectations are too high and they have no transferable skill set from Wall Street. So I saw a lot of suicides um, and metaphorical suicides. Um, people need to believe that if they follow the bliss, doors will open where only there were walls. The, the silent tragedy of relatively well-off people killing themselves at desks literally or figuratively, gets no coverage because these people are perceived as relatively wealthy. Um, but it doesn't change their psychological anguish and actually probably traps them in gilded cages. Um, and so that is the audience that I think fate has pulled me to speak to because um, it is a human tragedy and it's one that I feel people don't, don't, don't automatically think that they can be compassionate about. I hope that answers your question. 
Um, so what I'm hearing you say is that speaking directly to the humanness of people and inviting them into a world of potentialities that is way more beyond like what language, what their language, their fixed language can capture. And so like opening their aperture for exploring more potentialities is what I'm hearing from you. It's beautifully put. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Thanks. Isabella? Isabella, you have your hand. Go for it. Uh, so first of all, I don't know if you can hear me. If you can't. Yes. Much, better. Much better. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Don't know what happened. Okay. So um, if you didn't hear, I'm a developmental psychologist. I left academia about three years ago, full-time academia. So I had reached another kind of world's pinnacle um, a full professor very well off in terms of grants for the lab and so on and left that context and that relative success with H index having an experience that is similar to the 12 hour a day locked in a cubicle thing um, and having felt like our service in terms of developmental psychology or programs that use science and neuroscience and other kinds of things to help young people, most of our work ends up in these um, journals and it's in inaccessible to the people who care most about young people and young people themselves. So I understand a different world, but a very similar in terms of kind of existential, what the fuck is it all about kind of thing. What I want, and and having tried to move the needle within the system of academia to have people think about what they're doing and how much of it actually changes and how much of it, how many conversations or papers any real people um, engage with, I think there's a lot of similarity in terms of these kind of processes of a locked world that doesn't get you know heard and there isn't a lot of through way. And so I have a question, which is really about whether you think the viral tweet with the 250,000 um, likes and so on, how that, um, what is the word in, in business when you transfer them into behavior, it's called, ugh, there's a word, it's you make them into consumers. Anyway, the point is, I, I think there's something really important about how you get those people who are super excited to change their entire world view. And so yes. <laughs> I'm deeply interested in that hypothesis. How do you shift the viral tweet to behavioral change that actually is quite hard? And many of us would argue you do require pain and suffering, or at least the, the awareness of your pain and suffering. And I would argue that your leverage point, and, and by the way, it's, it's funny because I had, I was one of the people who did a interview with McGillchrist for two hours, right, um, through Perspectiva. And so tried to move McGillchrist from those two volumes into how do we do this to have impact on everyday lives. And I think he's very open to that discussion. He certainly has a lot of discussions with a lot of people, but he too no matter how many people in so many different silos he's talked to, finds it very difficult to get the behavioral change, right? So one question is, given your model, I totally get your model, I think, and, and very much I'm happy that someone's taking that leverage point. What do you see as that, um, that turning point? Again, I, there's a word for it. And the second question is, a really a hypothesis. My hypothesis is you don't get them with money and you don't get them with uh, spiritual purpose at the beginning. You get them with their children. There is one place that you will find every human, even those who don't have children, caring. And that is, do my do, what legacy do I have? And not legacy as in what buildings have I built for what wing, but do my do young people give a shit about what I've left? And is there anything on? But of course they care most about their own children. And so I think, I mean, that's why I'm so obsessed with creating liminal learning and a, and a developmental program for young people. And I'm wondering if you have direct interest and, and thoughts about how to make this viral tweety thing relevant to young people. 
around 18, those who are shifting from adolescence to adulthood. So, so just to check, Isabella, I hear two questions. Uh -huh. One, which is, I think, a really big question, Tom, you know, you can, we might come back to it. It's just, it seems, you know, even, but basically you can get attention, people can get really excited and it, it's like the classic psychedelic problem, you know, might say is like, you know, people have this incredible experience or even get really excited about an idea and it doesn't change behavior. That's what I heard first from you, Isabella. Like what, are there any thoughts about that question? Maybe not an answer, but just thoughts. And secondly, the relevance of this for young, kind of for young people and so on. So feel free to pick and choose there, Tom. And I think we'll come, certainly the first question is a big interest of life itself. And one, I think a lot of people, but we, we've been very interested in like, state to trade problem you know and it seems a tough a tough a toughie so anyway what are you any thoughts first of all yeah i think it's an incredible question because it's probably the most important one in the context of what we're talking about which is again like whoa what an interesting podcast am i going to change anything no um and equally i just come back from costa rica and have my mind blown by ayahuasca and the spirit told me i should quit my job am i going to do it no because I've just sobered up and I can't tell my wife and my investors that I've decided to liquidate my company because, you know, the spirit of Gaia told me to, right? And like all of these people will get even more narcissistic than they were because they think that they're the Messiah, right? Like, I, I, but to be constructive with your, with your question, um, there's no containers that I'm aware of that basically that these guys go through these experiences or start to get curious and then there's nothing that can hold them. Uh, they'll either go down the fake guru route or they'll um, go straight back into the world of Moloch or like they, they'll get bad information. Um, so like my own experience is relevant. I uh, had a Kundalini awakening uh, and also a psychotic break at the same time, because I think they are the same thing, right? Like in certain context and was immediately pathologized and was sent to the head of Columbia uh, psychiatry who was you know doing his doing his thing but he pointed to a section in his brain and said if i stimulate this part of your brain you'll believe in god there is no there there um and i was told i was never getting better um i was told i was in symptom management for the rest of my life um and i was grabbing onto every single faith system as a piece of driftwood to try and keep myself afloat instead of i drowned and there was really no one else i could speak to there were some people over the years that were very helpful to me but there was absolutely no community no sanka right um i believe you probably have to burn right like i believe like i burned for two years and all i'm here to do is to try and diminish the unnecessary suffering rather than necessary suffering. And I have no idea what the delta is between those things. I have no idea. I believe that you can, I see everything through a hero's journey structure, which I'm not gonna bore you guys with, but basically like at the start of the hero's journey, you have the call to adventure from the anima, then you have the refusal of the call, and then you have the crisis, and then you have the incorporation of the anomaly that, that throws people into crisis. I'm here to shorten that first part of the stage where it's like, you don't need a crisis to make the leap because you've got a little bit more faith that you can you can start to address these ideas. So it's just about trying to get people to pivot their mindset without having to burn their entire lives down. I don't know whether that's possible, but at least I can hold people's hands throughout that process. Now, I'd be interested in what you guys think about that because this is all very well and good, but how do you actually do it? And the answer might just be mighty bloody networks, right? That you have a, you have a digital platform with relatively restricted membership where you have resources, both in the form of links, but also people. I have a very robust network of, um, of I think, some of the best people in the world who I trust in from like transformational coaching to breath work to whatever, right? And with, with Ali and Christina in that mix, it's definitely world class. Um, and so just being able to, to traffic cop people to trusted resources, I think is huge. And part of my intention from that is um, is getting the people on the other side of that transaction paid, because a lot of the best practitioners and I know in this area are not being appropriately compensated for what they do. Often they're afraid to charge their worth, or people don't value containers. People don't. People are not willing to pay for wounds in a way that I find weird. Um, so, like, I want to be an intermediary in those transactions in a way that works, but also I want to create a, a resilient and persistent container that can hold people for as long as it takes for them to get through that process. I'm currently doing it informally, but I would like to do it formally. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Okay. 
I think we're, we're all, I, I, I'm really interested in the exploration of the question, actually. If you had just one answer, you would have had it. But I think it's, I, I, I really appreciate the, the reflection around it. I mean, if you, you guys are a community, right? Like I have spent nine months studying how communities fail in this space, technologically and ideologically, and just in terms of like what goes wrong. And you guys have experience in this. I'm interested, if, you know, don't have to discuss it now if you don't want to, but like what tech platforms work? How do these, how do these systems fail? Like, like what, what makes a good one? What makes a bad one? How do you actually do it on your mobile phone? Right? Like sure. what to do, you know? Yeah. We could, we could. I think this is a great topic. I want to be mindful. I think this is a topic in a moment we can come back to. We can, we, we can have thoughts on, and um, and also just to summarize what I hear, Tom, is in a way like which is really great. It's like I think I, what I heard, and it's a bit like if I can summarize a little bit for you, you can see I. It's like on the one part, there's really wonderful like humility. I think you're saying like it's not like I have the answer, which no one would hear would say that. And the, one of the hypotheses I hear you're saying is that particularly for these kind of hype agents, if given your, you know, in a way, given your existing connections and your, maybe an interest to say, and, and the context, you know, you can speak from an authoritative place in a way to this kind of audience of, of kind of high net worth type people. One of the issues you see is that there is, they have these kind of individual experiences, but there's not really a container. And one of the issues for containers is while there are containers out there, they're ones that those kind of people might not feel comfortable in, you know, that there's a, you know, for whatever reason, it could be the good reasons or the, the good reasons are kind of like, well, it's, it's very vulnerable as that kind of person. And also you're worried about other people taking advantage of you or in some way or whatever, you know, you want to be around other people like you a bit and the, the bad reasons you want some exclusivity or whatever. But what I heard is the end is saying, you know, combining a kind of container of some kind, community container with like, access to some of the kind of best type of people could really really kind of crack that nut a bit you know that's that's why here is the hypothesis is that something like that might make the difference where going on just doing the ayahuasca or whatever it is that people have done i'm i'm i'm, I'm caricaturing but like yeah. that lack of container is one thing that shows up for those for that kind of community at the moment is that they don't have a, a space which is ongoing where their kind of transformation is supported and sustained yeah, and I want to get to Lauren in a second, but I need to address yeah. that um, this is like, I think this this sticks in people's throat a little bit, but I, you've got to be realistic. Billionaires are not going to go on a mighty networks, right? Yeah. They're not going to be uh, in a vulnerable state. And uh, Jeff Bezos is not going to be like, hey, any of you guys got a Brene Brown talk I can watch? It's not going to fucking happen, right? Like, And so these guys need to feel that they're getting premium assets. But I think that means that they're willing to pay for premium assets. So I would not be surprised to see wisdom schools come back. I think they are already coming back where, you know, like the John Babaki type gets paid a bunch of money to come to a nice place in Austin into a compound where everyone can talk about what they want to talk about. And I actually think that's super cool. Like, I'm not sure I want to to, to be directly involved with that. Like, I want to be adjacent to it. And I think I can help get the, the right people in those rooms. Organizing those things is a completely separate endeavor. But th this is all still about taking that stale masculine energy and the money, the stock money into the feminine. I know that that conceptualization may not be quite right, but like if you can un if you can un un like block that energy and get it into the right places by people paying a boatload of money for experiences that I think are much higher quality than some of the other stuff they spend money on. I'm all for that because it's a marginal benefit. If they're cornering the best assets in the world, like Babeki, that's maybe more problematic. But Think about the leverage of one of those 26 changing their mind. And I know it's happening right now. Lauren, sorry, I want to get to you. Yeah, let's come to Lauren and then and sign. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, John. This is like really beautiful. Definitely yeah. activating a lot for me. Um, I have one question. You've kind of like touched on it and answered it, but I'm going to say anyway in case it sparks anything for you and then sort of add, add my second one. So when you mentioned in the beginning that you're, you know, by appealing to like the left hemisphere, it prompted in me this like sense of like is is there like a risk that in doing that there's kind of a validation of of, of behavior in that way like how how is the the journey into like dropping people to, in towards accessing like the right hemisphere or the more feminine energy sort of done you sort of alluded to like this stage approach and this container but I didn't know if there was anything else on that you wanted to add and my second one was i'd love to hear more around the anomalies that you've seen that you've identified that, that you could dive into a bit more thank you um, yeah i don't know what to say to the first question um 
I think the answer is always on the margin. Um, one of my friends who's much more spiritually advanced than me was like, you can never change anyone's mind. Um, but what you, what I like doing is digging a really wide brimmed rabbit hole and saying, look, look over here. You want to fall down this and then see whether people do. Um, and I've had, as I said, like 300 conversations with a, a range of left brain people over the last few years. And McGill Christ is the way in for these people because he's a elderly white dude with a 1500 page book with 700 references and 180 page bibliography on neurology and he trojan horses in the sacred and it's it's it, it's the best book i've ever read it's a masterpiece right because he he takes you through that transition and i think if you can meet people on different parts of that bridge it's great whether this revalidates bad behavior my god that's a great question and i think you have you're going to have to treat each person individually i think what you have to do and this is really hard and i really struggle to do this is to find winners within this context is to be like here's someone that fits your blueprint of success but has done it in a sage-like manner and my god that's hard i've been at that for three years and i can probably name like less than five examples of people that i could hold up uh, and a lot of those people often tend to incinerate themselves for interesting reasons um so that that's really really hard um and sorry i've now forgotten your second question it was just to invite you to discuss more around the anomalies that you've like oh, yeah. identified. Yeah, I'm glad I was hoping I could dodge that question. Um, we have a list. It's basically about scientific materialism, mostly. So I'll give you a few examples from woo to not woo. So um, from not woo to woo. So one of them is that like the late 20s, early 30s, rationalist community is obsessed with mental models and cognitive biases because it gives them a framework they can fit the world into right whereas actually they should be using the world to update their frameworks so rather than imposing a left hemisphere on the world they use the right hemisphere to update their, their stale frames right they just need to be upregulating the right hemisphere relative to the left um mm -hmm. but a lot of that group freaks out because it basically says that experience is very important uh when they would like to use mental models as an excuse for not having any experience. Um, and also because, as Isabella uh, pointed out, having your frames broken is incredibly painful. Uh, but there are systems like cognitive flexibility theory and accelerated expertise that can help people through this process very rapidly and make them in experts in bounded and unbounded domains um, to take on that 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 discomfort. So that's like one area where it's like, we're going to try and bootstrap your wisdom um, and then another area, like at the complete other end of the spectrum, would be my friend Mona, who um, has incredibly robust research on uh, the statistical effect, uh, the statistical reality of psi phenomena, which it's di it's more difficult to say what do you do with that anomaly, but it basically says that consciousness isn't likely bound by time or space. And I think the place that you can take that, maybe tenuously, is if consciousness isn't bound by time or space, is there an attractor outside of me that can be guiding me to a better place that maybe I should be paying more attention to, right? Like, am I more interconnected to the world? And I think once you get people out of that left hemisphere lock and start to make them think that, like, like, like maybe a, a better answer is synchronicities, right? The moment you tell people synchronicities exist, they can start to be navigated by them, right? But the moment people think that everything is random, they don't have access to that anomaly. And I think that's like a that's been a really huge thing for me that the more I'm on my beam, the more the more synchronicities accelerate, right? The better feedback I get from my environment. But that idea is taboo within certain circles. So we have a list of, I'd say, 20 different anomalies from a one on the woo scale to a 10. And I think as our content evolves, we're going to see what our audience wants. Um, but I think I think going with kids is one of the really helpful things I've come I've, that's come out of this conversation. Um, one of my favorite people in the world is a is an expert in children's intuition and has basically found that because of rep, the repression of intuitive and often psi related gifts kids get real sick and i think there's a general trend in this society of the repression of intuition for kids where they can sense something coming and they can sense something coming that's wrong and they feel disconnected from the world in a hundred thousand different ways and addressing that anomaly will really help the kids so i think that this conversation has helped me realize that that's one of the first places to focus because it also gives people intellectual permission because it's not them going after the woo it's to help their kids simon i think you are next 
Yeah, sorry, Simon. Did I, did I, did I address it you? It is Simon next. Yeah, thank you. Simon. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I, I, what I really, really like about your approach, Tom, is that um, you're one of the few people that really cares about the narrative of success and money, the present, you know, the present success and money, and how to tap into that. And I think that's a that's so important because we have so many people uh, in the regenerative community that want to just escape to an eco village and forget about the rest of the world. Um, and yes. um, so, thank you for that. Um, I my own what I'm really working on at the moment, I think more than anything else, is this idea of a variety of healing, learning narratives and healing narratives, learning journeys, learning stories, healing narratives. And I think you've got a really important one, an important one to add to the mix here. Um, and, and I think that that's the way I want to go. That's the way I want to go. Of what, how, how do we take that? And that appeals to some people. And how do we not say uh, this is the way forward? And how do we say this is a way forward for particular people, for particular people in the system who want to do that? And uh, I think that's great. It's a great addition. And I think we need the complete spectrum of this. Um, yeah. And the left and right talk. I mean, um, yes, uh, we, we had a study group on this, as, as some of us here know, uh, on, on the um, Begil Christopher Veiki Schmachtenberger conversation, which is a really interesting one. And um, the left and right talk. I think I, I, I still want to be really careful about this. I don't want, I, I really want to be careful about the masculine and feminine dimension as well, because it can easily, easily just jump into stereotypes. Ah, that's all. Okay. I think I'll leave it at that for a moment. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you for that reflection. Hola. Yeah. Hola and then Isabella. Or well, Isabella, I think, and then Hola. You're muted, Isabella. Just unmute and then. Uh... Um, what's really lovely right now is I've just had three texts come through in the last three minutes and, and it's just pure synchronicity and it's about, you know, these, we've just launched this little audio experiment where we get young people, teens talking to elders, um, and, and they're just doing audio messages back and forth. And it's really about dropping into their experience and sharing it. It's a very simple little experiment that, that brings them into their everyday experience, but also shares it. Anyway, and the point here that I wanted to just highlight, I did text it, but I didn't know if you'd see it, is that one of the amazing things is that people get very woo about children development too. And especially early raising of children and saying, we're all so natural when we're born and why can't we be that way? And and I actually think there's some very good evidence in, in developmental psychology. We've had it for a century around the kinds of things that we would like to continue to cultivate in right hemisphere like apprehending of the world and processing of it. And so it, when you teach the parents to teach or encourage that in their children, what happens is that they also, we know there's this huge, for example, correlation between parents' anxiety and children's anxiety, but you can flip that and do the opposite. And so when you're teaching these kinds of right hemisphere ways of being, you are actually embodying it at the same time. And there's this talk about Trojan horse way of getting in there. Uh, and parents are right now desperate about technology. The freaking height and his damn non-supportive uh, um, by data book. And, and so they really are actually interested in these very pragmatic strategies of how do I raise a kid in this digital world, right? So I just think there might be some, some really interesting inroads there. I know I just said that before, but I'm doubling down on it. That's all. I think it's super exciting. Um, because also stop with the diagnosis. Stop it. Stop it. Give me, give me what I can give. And one of the things Alison, my uh, my friend who's the, the intuitive expert, uh, just to reflect, one of some of the best advice she's given me, and she's given me a lot, is um, when you're experiencing an emotion, tell your kid. And my kids are two and five, but it's like, you know, I'm like, I tell my oldest five, I'm like, Jack, I just got a really annoying email from someone at work, and I'm really upset about it. And it normalizes emotional communication, but also kids mirror at that age, and they'll think it's their fault. So this, he's like, daddy's anxious. It might be my fault. And I'll have to manage his emotions. And I think growing up in an environment when you're trying to 
constantly trying to model your your parents and you don't understand where they're coming from emotional granularity i think is is, is kind of a superpower i, I want to get to Marta, so i'd appreciate more resources on that who you think is the experts but i want i need practice i need you know practical things my wife loves dr becky but like if, if there's any good resources you have on that that you think can land the plane Ola, and then uh, and then we've got Matthew, and we'll yeah we'll try and consolidate maybe these couple of questions because we're getting near the time. It's been amazing. I can tell we'll see what Tom might have to come back and do a, a follow up, but we'll see. We've got so many questions today. Great, Ola, and then and then Matthew, but maybe to get uh, you'll put them together and Tom can answer in one. So my question is how to bring some of this concept into practice because you can like just throw all these things out there for people and it's very hard to like move towards action. <laughs> and so like how do you see how do you think of action is it like day to day to day like suggestions or like it's just throwing hey like these are the things that you can do and then have people just go do it on their own which i guess they are not going to do it because sometimes these things are very difficult to do by ourselves so yeah what are what are your suggestions on action oriented um suggestions for people let's take matthew's question as well and then we'll come to mm -hmm. that one thank you okay um yeah i guess more of a, a comment or two First, just that I think, uh, yeah, that we should have a follow-up conversation because um, I think there's a lot of synergy here. Um, and I guess just the comment or I guess the phrase that I want to put in here is um, monkey see, monkey do, in the sense that I think a lot of people are, I don't necessarily want to say trapped, but kind of maybe that word could be used, trapped into thinking that there has to be a certain way of being in the world, whether it's like, uh, your job, a certain lifestyle, etc. And then I think slowly as that breaks or other opportunities become possible, then other people might see different ways of being. And I think that's, um, I guess I just wanted to, yeah, make that comment. Um, but yeah, more, definitely a longer conversation, um, in my opinion. Yeah, great. Thank you. I mean, I'll, I'll address them. And the, um, monkey see, monkey do kind of a related to the first question of like what it one of the one of the biggest dangers in the sense making community is a lot of the people i've run into i've then met them and got to know their family dynamics and they often haven't been particularly good um you know are a lot of these are a lot of these people walking the walk and be careful who you who you model um not that my life is perfect but i'm working on it um i think to address the practice question um there's two components i think there's a very well trodden you need to go do some more mindfulness shit which I kind of just bounces off me, to be honest. Right? But that's because it bounces off me. I think what you do is you present people with a menu within the container. Um, I think podcasts on practices probably aren't a great idea. It just doesn't, it just strikes me as quite niche because if, if you know, holotropic breathwork ain't your thing, and people shouldn't really be experimenting with these things online. I think that that's something where you draw people into the container. You know, River Kenner, who I'm actually talking to in 30 minutes, I don't know if any of you guys know him, but he wrote the best thing I've ever read on seven ways to, to right hemisphere yourself. So he's like, Miguel Chris never talks about how to do it. Here are seven things that I haven't seen other people talk about that do it. It was a great article. And I, po I posted it later to accompany my, my piece that's currently out there on the internet. Um, so that's really helpful. But I, I think it's more about like, if this interests you, here's where you can go with a practitioner that I trust. Um, like for me, I've, I've dropped into writing, DJing and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I'm just not a meditation guy. Maybe that's a fault of character, right? But it, I, I've at least had the option through these communities to incorporate uh, to incorporate these practices that really resonate with me on like a spiritual level. But I think that beyond the practices side, that's pretty well established. There's the worldview side, which is that like another entrepreneur called Scott Britton wrote a great piece on the, what's called he, he called the magical responsive reality, which is the idea that reality is constantly bringing you lessons, which you can incorporate into the reincarnation view of soul lessons, which again is an anomaly you can challenge, but later in the game, right? Where it's like, pay attention to the synchronicities. And I think actually getting people to upregulate external feedback in a mystical way probably is more effective than any individual practice, or at least it has been for me, because whatever the intelligence is outside of me, that's a more effective guide than whatever I think I'm going to get from the practices. Not that the practices don't help with that interconnection. Does that make sense? 
Yes, I, I think I think so. I think in the sense that one the very great point we're, we're strongly in agreement, which is that there's not necessarily one way. There's not one way up the mountain, and and offering a menu of practices, and even a menu of ecology of practices. I.e., there are different sets that go together. Is really really important and and valuable, and that yeah, not we don't, everyone just sitting on the cushion ain't necessarily going to be the way to way to it. And I'm and then I'm understanding there's a second point about the worldview, which. If I'm not sure I'm saying, but I will add is that we have much less maybe um, data or research on what leads to people to really shift worldviews. Um, I mean, we don't have a lot of actually great data on waking up. I mean, I, I told you, I, I think I'll ask about Jeffrey Martin. I put it in the link again, who definitely goes with this menu idea that I think you'd like actually ran a protocol model, right? Like, let's just take the greatest hits of waking up techniques and put them together and see what happens in a course. Um, but I think certainly... Um, and I know we're, we're at time. I guess we're going to run out of time today. I think the question, um, and, and first of all, I just want to be just our gratitude. So, Tom, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for sharing with us today. Um, it's not too early for you, but still early. And you and just, yeah, real appreciation. And as I said on our last call, so just appreciation, you know, we often feel it with people coming to this, but just of the journey that people, you're choosing to go on a different path than is the default. And with all of its wonderful parts, I know there are many, many rewards, especially on the waking up side, but also, you know, uh, have been hard things along the way. So just also a, a kind of gratitude and appreciation to you as a being, as a human being present with us today and the journey you've been on and what you're committed to contributing. It sounds absolutely fascinating. I think, as I said, maybe maybe we have a follow up if you're interested we could, or that this could be more discussion. I think the fascinating question at the moment that I think is like anyone needs to say they have the answer, but I think it's more like what are constructive theses and how can we explore them efficiently is what really does, what are good containers? What does lead to sustained change? Um, you know, to end with a story, like, you know, I know Thich Nhat Hanh, I, because I know Plum Village very well, Thich Nhat Hanh spent quite a lot of time from about the mid 2000s till when he had his stroke going to Silicon Valley and getting to sit with lots of the top Silicon Valley folks and give them talks at Google and other places about mindfulness and not being evil. and you know, talking to my friend, there's a question of why, you know, obviously it has some impact. It does, it, ha it has some, but why does it, what, you know, maybe it doesn't have as much as we know we might like or something. I think that's the question you're obviously really inquiring in. I think you've got a bunch of really good theses. Um, I, I still have this question, which is whether some of this stuff looks like playing the piano, that, that somehow people really have to shift their lifestyle and quite, like it's like, why going back to Isabella's point, people have to have some kind of breakdown or, or kind of, I don't mean that, but like some, kind, I don't mean a literal breakdown, but like something not working in life, the flat tire metaphorically, it might be the job loss. It might be suddenly just the, the meaningless of their work or that, that, that it won't even be enough to be on like a mining network with other supportive. They've got to be in some kind of container for a sustained period of time with, and I don't mean literally to live, but this is the question I think we're inquiring into. We don't know the answer of life itself, um, but I think that is just absolutely fascinating and one of the big things I got from today. Um, I also, the other thing I will just flag to people who are listening today and we're now at time that I would really think is worth acquiring is your point about the anomalies and what are ways, we're very interested with the secondrenaissance.net site that I shared, but in general, it's still quite for the, a bit for the in crowd, but how do we start communicating this to this broader audience. And I think your point of like, you know, let's go for the left brain guys, you know, let's really find people who can translate. It's a great point. And even the point of like rigorously, like okay, what are the anomalies we can point to? What are, you know, what are the examples we can speak to? You know, what are the areas people really carry about? Maybe it's their children, maybe, you know, um, you know, you've got everything. Now you can get wisdom, you know, whatever the offer is, I think also. So those are things I really took from your talk today as well. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much to be on time. It is one minute past. We want to let you know it go on time. And uh, yeah, let us know. It does sound like we're interested in maybe a follow up, maybe in a, a little bit of time. But yeah, love. Thank you so much. And maybe for everyone joining me and thanking, thanking Tom for today. Can I say one, one thing, thing? Say one thing to end, please. One, one final thing is that, you know, Ali's vision for this, I think, was pretty genius in that it's a network of networks that most people have these closed systems that never speak to each other. And we want this to be like a kind of a mycelium like network. Uh, and what we want from other people is ideas of things that have and haven't worked, but we also want content. Uh, and my ideal is that um, that there ends up being a lot of money in my container, and I can use that to to move 
resources from where they are to where they maybe should be. And I know there's a value judgment involved in that, but I want I want a container full of the, the, the most trusted resources in the world, but also people that are generating content for this kind of audience that's good. I want to be able to pay people for that content as well. So we just invert the model, whereas rather than a hundred different siloed organizations with their own language and their own goals, never reaching exit velocity, escape velocity, we want to invert that. And we, I appreciate that probably the only way you get that inversion is through money, maybe through cloud, right? Maybe through, maybe that if you, if you come onto the Rebel Wisdom 2.0 network, it's going to be called Leading Edge, by the way. If you come onto that network, you get lots of views. Maybe that's cool for people. I don't know. It's, for me, I, well, I, want, I want to make people money, right? And, and that's my goal. And, and yeah. So that, so. Well, we, we, would happily, we would happily be paid to produce content anyway. Well, that's it, right? Everyone would. Everyone would. Yeah. Um, all right, guys. Um, uh, great. Thank you. Thank for you input. so thank much. You. Yeah. All right. Lots of Bye. all the best, Tom. Until next time. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Tom. See you guys. Bye. See everyone.